Hello, Pastor Doug, back again with another response video. My atheist quiz video, I took a little quiz trying to figure out what kind of atheist I was. Uh, spoiler alert, I'm not an atheist. Has received several comments. And so I did a video response to a gentleman who left several interesting questions. Well, I had another gentleman who left a very interesting response to my response. And I'd like to walk through this because he took a lot of time and gave very interesting answers and I appreciate the time and I'd like to respond, but I'd like to respond verbally. It's just, it's much easier for me to do this. Uh, I have limited time. So I want to go through and read this gentleman's answers to the questions of the original response and I want to respond to it. So here we go. As an atheist and a secular humanist, I will respond to your answers to the questions. Okay. Are morals objective? You assert that morals are objective because they are based on God's law. Amen. However, morality can be objective without relying on divine authority. I don't know how you have anything that's objective unless you start with God, but let's read on. Objective moral principles can be derived from human well-being, reason, and the understanding of harm. I don't know how that's objective. That's your opinion. But well, let's read on. Philosophers like Immanuel Kant and John Stuart Mill have laid out moral systems such as a deontological ethics and utilitarianism that provide objective standards based on reason and human flourishing without the need for a supernatural being. So these are these moral systems, either Kant or Mill's, they are true. They are objectively true. They are a moral system that must be obeyed. I can go and read the commands and the laws that are required. That's not, if the answer is no, then it's not objective. Objective means outside of yourself. And it's interesting if you read Mill, and I'm no expert on Mill, I've read a few of his works. If you read Mill, he admits there's problems to the system because it has no foundation. And why do you have to obey anything they write? Why do I have to focus on human well-being, reason, and understanding of having no harm? By what standard? Why is that commanded? Why is that required? Well, if we don't do it, we'll have a bad civilization. So? And what if, you know, why can't we go and exterminate a small minority group within a society if that's going to benefit the vast majority of people. Why not? The atheist has no argument, no objective argument. You need to be able to point to something that's outside of yourself and say, here are the rules. This is objective. I don't think the atheist can do that whatsoever. Because why do I have to follow your rules? Why not? And let alone, who defines what's right and wrong? If you say, okay, we have to ha have well-being. Define what's well-being. Do we have an objective standard of what that is? Is going to church part of having a good life? The answer is yes, by the way. If you disagree, how do you know? Well, let's keep on reading. For example, the secular concept of do no harm is an objective moral standard grounded in empathy. <laughs> wow, how is empathy <laughs> objective? Cooperation and societal stability. Just because something isn't divinely commanded doesn't mean it can be objectively right or wrong. In fact, grounded morality and human experience can lead to more practical and compassionate ethics. Uh, human history is about violence, death, and destruction. Any quick reading of history will show you how brutal history really is. Unless you have some crazy Whig view of history that you think it's just evolving and getting better, which I would argue that's not the case. So, again, I disagree with this. How is this objective? I mean, it's nice that the atheists out there are trying to be uh, have empathy and have cooperation and have a stable society, but why? Why not? And how do you decide what's appropriate? Again, why not destroy? Why not go and murder a small minority population 
so that you can advance the civilization for everyone else. This is not objective. By definition, this is subjective. It's based on the individual, not something outside of themselves. Let's keep on going. Number two, objective moral duties. The idea that there are objective moral duties only if commanded by God is not convincing. Okay? I could argue that moral duties arise from the understanding that our actions affect others. Okay. Duties to care for the vulnerable, to tell the truth, or to act with compassion can be understood through empathy, rationality, and the recognition of a shared humanity. But is that objectively so? Is that an ought? Is that a required? If not, it's subjective. You don't need divine command to understand that hurting others is wrong. It's something we recognize through our capacity to suffer and experience happiness. What hap but what if my happiness is that I enjoy inflicting harm upon other people? By what objective standard can you say that's wrong? And again, it's like, well, that's bad for society. Well, unless I win, why not have justice belongs to the strong? This is not objective. This is by definition subjective. Pointing towards empathy, rationality, and a recognized shared humanity? What happens if people say, I'm not going to follow that? How can you tell me I'm wrong? Let alone empathy, man. Uh, a society based on empathy, that'd be terrifying. I'd rather have charity. Number three, is it immoral not to do an objective moral duty? Here you argue that failure to observe divine commandments is immoral. Yes. On the other hand, would on the other hand would frame morality in terms of the consequence of actions it's immoral to fail in your moral duties if doing so causes harm or undermines the well-being regardless of divine command for instance ignoring the needs of a drowning child is wrong not because god commanded us to act but because we recognize the inherent value of life and the ethical duty to help others in need. Again, I'm back to the same response. What happens if you don't recognize that? Now, I grant you, atheists can do very moral things. And they could have that sense of conscience or like, well, I should go save that child because why? We're made in the image of God. That's why. There's something transcendent in us. And that transcendence bubbles up again. My favorite one of my favorite arguments with atheists is you want proof that God exists? My proof is you because you can't live like an atheist. You have to steal the Christian worldview to function. So again, we're back to the same problem. Why not? Oh, and by the way, just on a tangent, uh, you, know, you know, we're talking about a drowning child. How about a child in a mother's womb? Should we save that child? Hmm. You know, what, what do most atheists think about that? Oh, moving on. Does God follow objective moral duties? This argument claims that God is beyond moral duties. Well, not, not really, but let's keep on reading. Because morality is a reflection of his character. Amen. The answer is problematic. If moral duties are arbitrary and depend on God's nature, then they aren't truly objective. They're subject to the whims of divine command. The euthyroid dilemma asks, is something good because God commands it, or does God command it because it's good? If God could hypothetically command something evil, then morality becomes subjective to the will, which, contra which contradicts the claims of objective morality. Um, I answered Euthyro's dilemma, and you recognized it as a, as a reflection of his character. Because Euthyro's dilemma is the notion, well, if they're, let's say, stealing is wrong. Is the concept stealing of wrong above God and God has to obey it. And if that's the case, then who made that law? There's someone above God. Or if stealing is wrong and that's just God's whim, then why can't God go steal one day? And so therefore there's the problem. The answer is actually quite simple and I, um, he mentioned it right here. The reason stealing is wrong is because God's not a thief. It reflects his very, it's a reflection of his very character. That's why stealing is wrong. 
And, you know, yes, God can't do anything he wants. He cannot deny himself. So, you know, some extreme notion of libertarian free will, well, that is that is contrary to Christianity. So, I gave you the answer. Um, Euthyro's dilemma is really easy to answer. Again, it's a reflection. Morality exists because it reflects God's character. Well, let's keep on going. Furthermore, it should be noted that morality should be evaluated based on on its effects on human beings. Again, by what standard? Why do I have to obey that? By by what standards are we going to use for the evaluation? I, this is all just a house of cards. Not based on a presumed nature of a deity. Again, this is just subjectivity. All right, the drowned child is an example. Your answer here insists that saving a drowned child is a moral obligation under Christian law. Amen. And suggests atheists have no reason to save the child. That's correct. Now, many atheists would save the child. I don't deny that, because again, why? They're made in the image of God. This is simply untrue. Second humanist emphasizes empathy, compassion, understanding of shared human ex experiences, which I'm happy for. I'm, I'm glad second humanists have somewhat of a shadow of God's law, that loving your neighbor is a good thing. That's helpful. I, I agree with that. They can't justify it as the problem. They desire to prevent harm and preserve life, <laughs> abortion, is a fundamental human instinct, grounded in social co cooperation and empathy, not a religious commands. I I'll be honest, when I, as we see societies that become more and more atheistic, they have no respect for life. I mean, you know, think of the Soviet Union, think of Eastern Europe, think of North Korea, think of China. I, I disagree with this. When atheists get their way, it's just a death cult. I, I don't mean to be just you know mean, but it's just simply not true. Again, there are atheists out there because they grew up in the West will do moral things, but that's a leftover of Christian culture. Well, let's move on. Most atheists and second humanists recognize the importance of of act of acting to prevent harm, uh, and they often do so out of intrinsic sense of responsibility and care for others. I, I'm not sure that's true, but uh, I'll go with it. Moreover, the argument that atheists are pro-abortion, oh, yay, he's responding. Again, I'm doing this cold. And therefore less concerned with life is misleading and a red herring fallacy. Uh, okay. Pro-choice advocates don't support the slaughter of children, but rather the right of individuals to make personal medical decisions. <laughs> I'm sorry. We, we just declare someone not human so we can slaughter them to make ourselves feel good. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, no, no, no. Jews, they're not humans. It's okay to exterminate them. Oh, man. Craziness. Many atheists, like many religious people, value life and believe in policies to promote well-being of individuals in complex and nuanced ethical frameworks. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is where you get genocide from. <laughs> no, that's madness. I, I don't mean to be rude because this person's being sincere. I get it. I, I appreciate he's being calm and rational, but I, there's a point where you just have to call evil evil. All right. Greater good and evil. The arguments that God doesn't need to intervene to save a child because humans are sinful and God's plan transcends human understanding is Amen. Is problematic from a humanistic point point of view. Oh no, no, but no doubt. This defense of suffering, especially the suffering of children, suggests that God's actions are inscrutable and justified by a larger unknown purpose. Well, by his good will, which is not fully known, I, I agree with that. I can reject this reasoning, arguing that allowing unnecessary suffering is unethical. Uh, again, by what universal standard, regardless of the supposed greater plan. If humans are held to the standard of intervening to prevent harm, then it seems contrary for an omnipotent, benevolent God to exempt from that standard. You notice he didn't deal with my fundamental argument, and that's sin. This is one of the big differences between Christianity and atheism. Atheism really doesn't believe humanity's fallen. And that's a huge problem. That's, that's the answer. Humanity is sinful. Again, the mystery is not hell. The mystery is heaven. Let's keep on going. Punishing innocent children for the sins of others. Here you do agree that punishing innocent children for the sins of their parents is wrong, according to biblical law. 
Yet many religious teachings, particularly the concept of original sin, suggest that children bear the consequences of the actions of others. So, um, those are different categories, but yes, we, we inherit that defect, that sin from our first parent, Adam, that's true. But we are judged not because of Adam, but because we're sinners. Second humanists would reject this idea entirely, I know, as it is unjust to hold anyone responsible for the actions they did not commit. I, again, but they don't have a universal concept of justice, but I, I'm, well, let's, let's move on. Humanism emphasizes individual responsibility and fairness, which is why collective punishment, particularly of innocence, is morally indefensible. Uh, how do we define what's innocent and not innocent? And, and by the way, you're right. There's, a, again, a difference between, you know, the father steals something and the son is innocent. The son should not be punished for that action. And that's biblical law. However, when it comes to original sin, the sin is passed down. It, it's the concept of the federal head. And so as corruption goes down, that corruption affects individuals and you're punished because you are fallen. If you want to understand Christianity, you really have to get the concept of sin. Atheists don't have that concept, and it leads to all sorts of problems. All right, number eight, stopping an assault. Now you claim that Christians have an objective reason to stop harm, such as an assault. Yes, well, atheists don't. Again, many atheists will do that. I don't deny that. But what objective reason do they have? That's my question. This is a common misunderstanding and a straw man fallacy. Oh, okay. Atheists and second humanists often act morally, not because of religious commandments, but because they recognize the intrinsic value of human life and the importance of reduced suffering. Again, I admit it, atheists can do moral things because they're in the image of God. Many moral systems, from secular ethics to evolutionary biology, explain why humans are driven to protect others, often at the great personal cost. Those don't fully answer the reason. Again, we are made in the image of God. And as much as the atheist tries to suppress that suppress that in unrighteousness, it bubbles up. You know, when you steal from a thief, they're going to complain, how dare you steal from me? It's going to bubble up. All right, number nine. The poison fruit and the con artist, the Garden of Eden analogy. The analogy of a, of a parent placing the child in a dangerous situation, knowing they'll be tempted to fall, is a clear reference to Garden Eden's story, which I think I mentioned in my response. Second humanists would argue that this situation reflects poor ethical reasoning. Putting someone in harm's way and blaming them for the inevitable failure is unjust. Hmm, good thing on that one. Putting someone in harm's way and blaming them for the inevitable failure is unjust. Well, if it's done for evil, but, you know, you put soldiers into dangerous positions and yet they can be court-martialed for cowardice, again, just think of that one out. But let me read on. The story of the fall, the story of the fall raises questions about free will. Oh, I agree with that. I'm a Calvinist. Responsibility and justice. A secular point of view would suggest that a truly loving parent, an ethical parent or deity would not create such a scenario in the first place. Now, this of all the questions, I think this is the best one. I'll be honest. As a Christian, I'll, I'll cop. I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be flippant. I just, I, this notion that subjective individuals is an objective standard, I think that's a crock. That's full on. This is a good question. This is a tough one for Christians. And, and again, by the way, I do not believe in libertarian free will. I do believe in compatibilist free will, and I know many atheists don't believe in libertarian free will either. Yes, God created Adam, knowing that Adam would fall. Why? So that he could show forth his glory and save his people. Now, I know for the atheist, that's a really hard thing to understand. But it's not some random thing. It's not some, oh, I'm just going to throw you know, this, you know, this child in with this questionable tempter for some random reason. That's not the case whatsoever. It's for a purpose. Again, that God be brought glory 
that Christ be shown forth so that we can see the much more full measure of God's goodness in Christ and that his people be redeemed. Because merely keeping creation from falling is not miraculous. You know, it's like having a can of white paint and say, keep it white, and like, okay, I'll put it on the shelf. But imagine you take the can of white paint, fill it with dirt and oil and all sorts of filth, filth and shake it up and say, okay, make it white again. That requires something much more miraculous. And so God's act of redemption shows his glory now i understand for the fallen earthly mind that makes no sense oh but it's the most beautiful thing there is and again why does an atheist have to complain they do not have any objective standard of morality to begin with because they're focused upon their self well i hope that helps and by the way thank you for this person i, I appreciate uh their statements it, it was very well thought out from their perspective um, I, I put in strong language, not to be rude, but to just show forth the problems. Um, well, I hope this helps. As always, Christ's grace and peace to you all. Amen.